It was wonderful that Dr. Michael Youssef had hosted us here in London today for leading the way with such a diversity of nations represented, I think 13 nations represented. I'll get the truth. That's why I like listening to Dr. Youssef, because I know he uh, doesn't add or take away from the Word of God, and that's what excites me. We are so excited. Dr. Michael Youssef from Leading the Way is bringing that unity in the churches and breaking down the walls of division. When Michael Youssef and his team started to share about this uh, evangelistic campaign uh, coming to Egypt, I was uh, celebrating and uh, I felt this is a, a wonderful opportunity and wonderful timing now to call people to repent and come back to the Lord. You don't have to do anything other than come to Him. That's all you need to do, come to Jesus. And I'm so excited to hear about the vision that Dr. Michael has to reach one million new souls for the kingdom of God. It's an inspiration for me. It gives me hope that the Great Commission can be fulfilled in our generation. It's a neutral space. We can find our politics underneath the banner of what the gospel, Christ crucified, dead, buried, raised from the grave. This is different. It feels different. It feels like a collective. It feels like our city is coming together, and that's a beautiful thing. I am amazed at how many people were here and how many people gave their life to Christ. It was really indeed a life-changing moment. The Caesars, who ruled Rome with an iron fist, abused power. In Palestine, the Roman soldiers perfected the use and the abuse of power. And yet our Lord himself, who was conscious of the abuse of power all around him at that time, he gave his disciples a unique type of power that the world had never known before. Of course, he gave them power over sin. He gave them power over evil spirits. He gave them power over diseases and sickness. But he also gave them a power that the world had never known, that the world could not comprehend at the time. He imparted to them the power of love. In John 13, and I hope you turn to it with me, please, Jesus told his disciples that he's going to literally give them secret to power that, the, that they would change the world through them. And I think all of us have experienced the feeling of powerlessness. We all know the feeling of powerlessness, and when we stand helpless and powerless in front of a formidable disease, uh, foreboding circumstances, and certainly we stand helpless in the face of death. Those are the moment when we feel powerless. And Jesus said to everyone who would be their disciple in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. I think anyone who knows the Scripture, with this at the moment, he said, hang in there, wait a minute, wait a minute, what is this thing about new? How can that be a new commandment when the greatest commandment in the Old Testament is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength? and you love your neighbor as yourself. How can that be new? Thank God he gives us the answer in the next sentence, that I don't have to come up with the answer. And this is what is new. As I have loved you, so you love one another. That's what's new about it. You say, why? 
because nobody ever seen this kind of love. Nobody loved like Jesus. In verse 35, he said, by this love, the world will know that you are my disciples. Whose disciple? Jesus. Whose disciple? Jesus. When the world sees the disciples of Jesus loving one another by the power of the Holy Spirit, supernaturally, divinely. Now, you notice that he did not say, the world is going to appreciate you for that love. He didn't say that. He did not say, the world will applaud you for your love. He did not say, the world is going to welcome that kind of love or going to welcome you because of that kind of love. He said, no. The world will know you by that love. He will know you. That's how they're going to know you. They may not like you. They may hate you. But at least they will know you by this kind of love. Now, if you already asked the question, who in the world can love like Jesus? You're not alone. You're not alone. I've asked that in the past, and indeed, I ask that question often. But hang in there with me, okay? <laughs> Let me highlight the greatest challenge first before I get to the core of the text. I want to highlight the challenge, and it's unprecedented in my lifetime, and I know in most of your lifetimes. The challenge for the disciples of Jesus right now in this 21st century, when it comes to love like Jesus, we have a modern challenge. Every generation has its own challenges. I'm not de denying that at all. But we have a unique challenge right now about love. Because in Western culture, we have torn that word love to shreds. Love now means loving sin, not the sinner, just the sinner, which we're commanded to, but loving the sin. Loving now means Love what is wrong and shun what is right. Loving now means that objective truth is wrong. But loving like Jesus means, listen to me please, it means absolute, total, and equivocal obedience to the Word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Now, in today's world, their motto is, if you love me, you will let me, and then you fill in the space. That's, that's really what is going on in the very core of our culture today. And you notice where the emphasis is here. Me, 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 me. But Jesus' love is not focused on the one who wants to be loved. Jesus' focus is on the one who's doing the loving not the one who demands it. Someone would say, well, Michael, are you trying to tell me that I should do all the loving and not expect to be loved back? Bingo. <laughs> but bingo means hit the mark. I said, as I said before, that our culture has perverted the whole concept of love. Now, beloved, we must teach the next generation that it is out of love that we condemn sin. Why? Because sin is harmful, because sin hurts families, because sin destroys communities, because sin creates an upheaval in society, and ultimately sin dishonors God. And if you love Jesus and love like Jesus, we must point to the harm of sin. Don't ever hesitate. Don't ever hesitate. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Whose disciple? Jesus. In John 13, where Jesus told them to love one another, it was right 
after he washed his stinky feet. <laughs> and beloved, this is not a derogatory term. This is not about the smelly feet. I said the stinky because it, is, was, it was stinky feet. <laughs> the, this is a fact. Back then, they did not wear socks and, and, and nice shoes and, and, and rode on cars and walk on paved roads. No, they were either barefooted or flimsy sandals and walking in dirt road. Not only that, but the washing of the feet when a person, a guest comes into the house was always relegated to the very lowest in the service hierarchy. That was the task that was given to the lowest among the servants. But there's more. You and I might understand Jesus washing Peter's feet, right? He's the CEO, COO. He was the chief operating officer of this outfit, the disciples. He was a chief disciple. You understand Jesus washing his feet. You understand Jesus washing John's feet. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he leaned on Jesus' shoulder. <laughs> but Judas, Judas' feet, Jesus knew that Judas already sold him down the drain. Jesus knew that Peter's going to deny him three times. Jesus knew that every one of them are going to flee and leave him all alone. And yet, the explanation is in verse 1 of chapter 13. Verse 1, he loved them to the end. We probably would say he loved them to the bitter end. To the bitter end. There is no end to his love. Now, beloved, this is not human love. This is not self-serving love. This is not selfish love. This is not twisted love. This is redemptive love. This is divine love. This is brand new kind of love that they've never seen or experienced before. And that is why I said in the very beginning, it is neither natural nor easy. This is supernatural. And this supernatural love is why we can never, never, never manufacture. We can never, never accomplish in a hundred lifetimes. We cannot do it in our own strength. Only God can love through us. And that is why it is totally required a total absolute surrender and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit of God can empower us to exercise this type of love. Am I saying loving like Jesus is easy? Absolutely not. Only Christ himself can empower us to love like Christ. Whose disciple? Jesus. And the question remains, how do we love like Jesus? How do we love like Jesus? Here are several steps I'm going to share with you from my heart and do with them what God leads you to do. Every time, that's the first step, every time you are hurt by a brother or sister or another disciple of Christ. Now, whether that hurt was intentional or unintentional on their part, because sometimes it's unintentional. The first thing, the first step that should occur is this. Confess to yourself, admit to yourself that, yes, she hurt me deeply. Yes, he abused me. Yes, she destroyed me, nearly destroyed me. Please do not deny reality. This is the problem. Don't deny reality. Admit the wrong to yourself. Admit it. Confess it to yourself. Do you get that? To yourself. And then ask yourself the question, did Jesus forgive me? Does Jesus continue to forgive me? Does Jesus keep on forgiving me? And you're going to find the answer is yes. Then how come 
I'm happy to receive forgiveness from his hand, but not dispense forgiveness to others in his name. Amen. Now, beloved, all of us, the disciples of Jesus, are compelled to love like Jesus. Loving like Jesus compels us to call sin, sin. Compels us to condemn sin. It compels us to never pretend that it didn't happen. Beloved, that's sentimentality. First of all, after you take the first step, and you verbalize it, confess it to yourself and to God, that the hurt is real hurt. The second thing is that I verbally, in the presence of God, and only in the presence of God. Did you get that? I'm going to repeat it. Only in the presence of God, I declare my forgiveness for that person. Just to God. Only to God. That's the second step. Because then and only then, when and if the person comes and asks for forgiveness, you're ready to dispense it. Listen to me. If they never come and ask for forgiveness, keep it between you and God. You dealt with it inside here, in your heart. Why I'm saying this? Because if you walk up to somebody and say, I forgive you, the person might never have been aware that he did any, cause any hurt, eh? or, or, or just never refuse to acknowledge it. I mean, you get yourself into hot water. When someone comes and asks for forgiveness, don't pretend that it was not a problem. Don't say, oh, that's all right. Don't do that. And now people do that. Don't say, oh, don't worry about it. They should worry about it. <laughs> calling sin, sin, beloved, listen to me. Calling sin, sin is not judge, being judgmental or harsh. It's being honest. It's being truthful. When a person asks for forgiveness, thank them. Thank them. Don't say, yeah, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to forget. You see, forgetting, as I said, doesn't mean you're going to get knocked in your head and have an erasing of the memory. That doesn't mean that in the Scripture at all. When God forgives and forgets, it doesn't mean that God, somehow, the all-knowing God, the all-powerful God, lost his memories. No, but when the Bible talks about God forgets our sin, it means that he does not hold it against us in the future. It means that he does not keep an account ledger on the file and files it away and brings it out every payday. <laughs> it does not mean that at all. It means he removed it from the debit card. It's no longer there. Then love like Jesus. You know, when Peter den denied Jesus three times after warning him, he denied Jesus three times. After the resurrection, Jesus didn't walk out to Peter and said, Peter, I forgive you that miserable thing you did denying me after I warned you? He asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? So the question is, when do you think Jesus forgave Peter? I'm going to show you. Immediately, as soon as he heard the third denial, <laughs> because the Bible said Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And after the resurrection, Jesus said to the women to go and tell the disciples and Peter of his resurrection. Something else I want to tell you as I'm coming toward the end here. When Jesus forgave the crowd standing there, here he is, stretched on the gibbet. Agony. He didn't say, I forgive you, you miserable people. 
or even just I forgive you. He didn't talk to them at all. He talked to his father. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Forgive them. It was between him and the father. When you hurt, talk to your heavenly father about those who hurt you by forgiving them. Because only the Father can give us that supernatural power to forgive. Why is this so important? Why I'm harping at it like a broken record? The reason for that is because the Bible said, if I incline a sin in my heart, God will not answer my prayers. God will not answer me. Where, where, is, it, where, where is the incline? Inwardly, inside, when nobody can see it, when, I, inside them. If I hide the sin of unforgiveness, if I nurture the sin of unforgiveness, if I host the sin of unforgiveness, if I entertain the sin of unforgiveness, God will not answer my prayer. There are some who are angry with God. You may be one who's angry with God for whatever reason. Because he allowed something that's so unfair and unjust as far as you're concerned, and you're angry with God. Well, I find that very blaspheming. It's a blasphemy. You need to ask God to forgive you for not understanding that in all things, how many? God working together for the good. Who's disciple? Jesus. Let me tell you this true story as I conclude. It's about a man named David Simmons. He was an offensive back with St. Louis Cardinals, the New Orleans Saints, and the Dallas Cowboys. His father was a very harsh man and, and a demanding military man who rarely said a good word or an encouraging word to his son. When Dave began playing football in high school, his father criticized him mercilessly. No matter how well he played, Dave's father would come to him after the game, didn't even wait till he got home, right after the game, with a list of mistakes that he made. After a successful college career, he went to the NFL draft. He was selected by the St. Louis Cardinals as the second round pick. Dave was so excited that he called his father immediately to tell him the news that he was drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals. And Dave's father's response was, quote, how do you feel to be second? Those words, Dave said, stung, stung him. But because Dave gave his life to Christ and he wanted to love like Christ, he kept on loving his dad. He kept on loving his father. In the years that followed, David would visit with his dad, his father, and, and he would love on him. And one day he began to ask his father about his, his own upbringing, the father's upbringing, his childhood. Something Dave's father never talked about. But Dave's love finally got his father to open up and talk about his own father, Dave's grandfather. He was a lumberjack with a nasty temper. Not only that, Dave's grandfather beat his father when he was a boy so severely. Never said a positive word to his son. These conversations really opened Dave's eyes to the kind of upbringing his father had and experience and why he was the way he was. And David recalled that because of these conversations, his loving his father like Jesus, he would say, and I'm going to quote word for word here, by the time he died, I can honestly say we were friends. Loving like Jesus, 
is the mark of discipleship. You know, the pagans in the second century A.D. used to say, and it was quoted by Tertullian, one of the early Christian fathers, he used to say, oh, look at them. Look how they love one another. And beloved, the world will be able to look at Jesus' disciples in the church of the apostles. In these dark days, in these last days, they'll be able to look at the disciples of Jesus in this church, and they would say, look how they love one another. Begin your day with the timeless wisdom of Scripture and be encouraged as you reflect on Dr. Michael Yusuf's daily devotional, The Daily Way. Journey with Dr. Yusuf into the very heart of God through 365 daily Bible readings and devotional reflections designed to help you grow in Christ. Whether you're looking for guidance in marriage and family, want a clearer understanding of prayer and praise, or are eager to explore the profound teachings of Christ, The Daily Way is more than a book. It's a companion for your spiritual journey. In addition to the teachings, it includes blank pages for your notes, prayers, and reflections as God works in your life throughout the year. In The Daily Way, you'll be reminded that God's grace is for our past, present, and future, transforming us into the people He intends us to be. The Daily Way is available now for your gift of any amount to Leading the Way at ltw.org. That's ltw.org. Begin your journey today. Visit ltw.org today to grow your relationship with Christ. Always reaching out to us. God is the one who always wants to bless us. God is the one who always trying to pursue us. Strengthen your faith as you watch, listen to, and read sound biblical teaching from Dr. Michael Yusuf. New programs and articles are posted daily. Receive encouragement as you hear miraculous stories of God moving here at home and around the world through Vision 2025, a strategic ministry expansion plan to reach as many people as possible for Christ by 2025. Take a quick break and receive spiritual refreshment as you read one of Dr. Yusuf's daily e-devotionals. Everything on ltw.org can easily be shared through email or your favorite social media platform making it easier than ever to tell others about Christ. Visit ltw.org today. Be encouraged and join our global gospel movement. Passionately proclaiming uncompromising truth, leading the way with Dr. Michael Yusuf. thanks you for your faithful support through your continued prayers and gifts. 